What have you been <laughs> watching? All right, live stream that. And also, I'm going to record it too, just so I have it. Okay. So awesome. Nice. So, yeah. So, we're about like three minutes early, but yeah. And so, what have I been watching? Have you been watching The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? No, I haven't, but it looks oh, good. So and I kind of want to, yeah, I kind of want to watch it because Tony Shalhoub is in it. And he's just like, the oh best. man, he's hilarious. Yeah, he's really funny. You know what? I've been watching Wings uh, lately because it's just like, oh, Wings TV. is good. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of that. Tony Shalhoub. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. What about you? What have you been seeing? Um, we just started watching that. Um, the Lakers documentary thing on oh, HBO Max, Winning with John Time. John C. Riley. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the the forming of the the dynasty, you know, with mm-hmm. Magic Johnson and all that. Cool. Looks I, pretty interesting. I mean, Adam McK- Adam McKay stuff in the Big Short's great. Mm-hmm. Don't look up. All of his movies are pretty good. So. Yeah. Can't wait to see what he does with a with a series format you know should be good yeah oh was it i i also watched uh the batman i saw it I saw what it really me. yeah i i would so, highly so kayla, kayla and amy feel free to like type into the um chat if you would <laughs> like to join into the conversation about what things that you're watching because we're really interested in that but i am interested to hear what you think about a three hour and 15 minute batman um, it seems long it it didn't feel long because you're going along with no. the narrative and it's just like like it's super clean like everything makes sense when they're going through it and it's just so good that's cool yeah and like that's cool I mean, obviously, I'm from the generation that knew Robert Pattinson as like, oh, that guy from Twilight. He's he's Edward. So it's like, right. there's that connotation. Yeah. But Cedric, also, Cedric Diggory. Cedric, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, over the past couple of years, he I started watching more of his stuff, and he like really solidified in my mind as an author or author uh, as a actor. And yeah, yeah, so he he just he hits it out of the park in this one, man. He's such a good Batman. Oh cool yeah. man <laughs> yeah i heard someone say it was like his batman and bruce wayne were kind of indistinguishable though he was like moody batman and moody bruce wayne yeah so i, haven't, of, I haven't seen it yet but yeah. yeah it kind of fits with like the early years aesthetic where he's just like he's all like yeah. emo and it's like Ugh, i'm batman you know? <laughs> i don't want anything to do with wayne enterprises I just he's getting his cry. voice there yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh it's yeah. five o'clock let's start man five o'clock all right yeah so to, to everyone watching along um nick and i will be moderating the chat so um oh we have one in right now it's on my list it looks really good kayla says yeah she hasn't seen it yet but it's on my list it looks really good but i've been watching a lot of anime good for you heck yeah i approve <laughs> i would watch more anime if i could that's a so Turned yeah, so stamp of approval right there. <laughs> yeah, so Nick and I have been working together on this um, comic book project from the American Indian College Fund, um, and that's basically uh, we we were to do uh, four workshops uh, for the public. We've done each individual one. I did one, and Nick did one. I did one about the writing. Nick did one about the drawing, mm-hmm. uh, the visual, and now we're doing sort of a a third together where we're going to be talking about our process of creating our our universe that our comic book is based in yeah anything to add nick no i think you really covered it and we kind of gave a little bit of a sneak peek as you mentioned before of like how our process is where we talk about like the media that we're consuming right now and just you know (laughs) yeah i'll get into that in my in in my uh, powerpoint but oh yeah so yeah um so did do you want to flip a coin or should I go first or did you want to go uh, first? You can go first. I'm just going to. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll moderate a little bit uh, and also put in the registration cool. for anyone that comes in on Facebook. So. All right. Okay, I'm going to share my screen, everybody. I created a, um, a PowerPoint for us here today. 
Get that going. All right. Okay, so the universe of creation, Nick and I's project together here, the process of making our universe. Pictured here is the one above all from the Marvel universe. He's sort of like a God figure in that comics universe. So I thought it was apropos for him to be on there. Plus I was telling Nick, he looks like one of my uncles. Okay, so initial steps. So the who, what, when, where, and why of our project. As you can see, I have a little um, time capture video going here of Nick and I's process working together, um, doing our thumbnailing from the script to minute. Those are little miniature comic book pages that, that uh, Nick is working on there. So, so who, what, when, where, and why. Considerations that we took into account. Um, this comes uh, right from our project, our grant proposal. It's a, a sentence right from our proposal to provide a visual narrative representation of the Menominee theoretical model of sustainability. So the Menominee theoretical model of sustainability, if you guys don't know what it is, you should look it up because it's a very interesting tool for problem solving, community planning, pretty much anything you'd want to use it for. It's pretty useful. But um, I'm not going to get into the, the weeds about the individual facets of it and everything like that. We're just going to go on to, uh, talking about our project here. But that it was sort of the, um, it was the anchor head for our, our project. We we're basically building our comic book around that theoretical model. So when, when is this taking place? We want to be able to remember the past, but embed our readers in the present with an eye toward the future. So um, what this basically means is that we're going to be handling maybe one or two flashbacks. We, I don't want to do any spoilers or anything like that. But um, yeah, we're, we're going to definitely um, pay homage to the past while being in the present, as in like 2022, but in our little universe. And then if you when you read the comic book, you'll see that we wrote with an eye towards the near and distant future the story goes that way. So that was one of the uh, founding tenets for us when we started working together. Okay. I'm gonna move ahead here. There you go. Okay, so write and create to a young adult audience with accessibility and interest for all ages. This is the who. So we wanted to be able to create a story that would be sort of in that range of young adult audience. I would say maybe like sixth to high school senior, sixth grade up to high school senior with availability and you know accessibility and interest for someone down to maybe like fourth, fifth grade and then all the way up to elders would be interested in the story. So that's who we tailored it for. So where is, we based it in and around the Menominee Reservation, um, our home homelands here in Northeast Wisconsin and why. So we wanted to illustrate the usefulness of the Men uh, Menominee theoretical model of sustainability in both application and incidental influence. I put that really weird wording at the end to basically state that we have the kids explicitly using the model in the story, but also we tried to show that just through skills, personality type, um, group, or, you know, like a um, friend group, just being a group, they automatically sort of fall into aspects of the model. So that's the incidental influence. And I feel like, you know, any uh, group that you have or community or neighborhood or household, you'd be able to see where people fall in to that Menominee theoretical model of sustainability once you look that up. So that's our initial steps. So the next thing, was like reining it in. That was the hard part. So it's like, okay, create a universe, right? I mean, where do you start? That's the whole thing. I think we did a really good job of um, establishing our who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, we also sort of initially talked about how we wanted it to be grounded in somewhat of a reality, um, like a, an imaginable reality, not strictly reality, but you know, some somewhat of a 
fictional universe that we created, but nothing like a DC universe or like a Marvel Cinematic uh, Universe or anything like that. So our inspirations for creating our our universe uh, were pretty far reaching. We we relied a lot on print, especially comic book that we both love. I mean, we we talked a lot about um, authors and artists that we love, and um, also, we talked a lot about novels um, and paperback novels, hardback novels, going all the way back to like, um, you know, Victorian, er late Victorian era with um, the modern day Prometheus of Frankenstein with Mary Shelley, which was a big um, inspiration for the story. And uh, all the way up to recent stuff like Ready Player One, which just came out like in the last, you know, 10 years. God, it's 10 years already. Okay. Uh, anyway, so that, you know, we, we look to print also um, to help us out. So the visual, um, as those of you who are in the beginning of the meeting noticed, like the first thing we started talking about was what are you watching? What are you watching? So I feel like um, the visual, the film, television and streaming influences that are such a big part of everyone's life, um, they really tinged this project in a way that we really um, pay recognition to films, television and streaming from our pasts. And I think it's valuable that, you know, I'm 45 years old, Nick is just getting into his early 20s. So we do represent, you know, two separate uh, generations. So we have some really great, uh, far reaching, varied references from film, television and streaming. So the digital, this is a very important component, I feel like to, um, to include research that's been done on the tribal, at the tribal college level at, at CMN and other tribal college, other tribal colleges, institutions. So we referenced uh, keynote addresses, presentations by former and current students, and also um, scientific research um, in the realms of like plant pathology and veterinarian, um, the field of veterinarian uh, medicine and uh, basically like also toxins. We really looked into toxins. It's a big part that that's kind of a spoiler. I won't go any further than that. But um, yeah, the digital realm, the online research was a big part of it. So we made sure to um, do our due diligence on all three of those. Also, fourth basically hold, held a fourth space open that was sort of like a blank slate for us to bring in inspiration from everyday life, from our families, from friends, uh, acquaintances, you know, experiences that we've had on jobs in school. So we held like a, an open space also um, to bring in our own life experience into the, the script writing and, and universe creation process. So what's the feeling? For me, this is my favorite slide because um, I, I spent so much time with the script and also um, worked really closely with Nick. We, we generally met like once a week, at least. Um, there were periods where we wouldn't meet for a week or two, but we were always, um, you know, texting or emailing um, ideas, websites, you know, books that we ran into. So we were, we were in pretty good contact about the script. But for me as the writer <clears throat> and uh, co-creator of the universe, you know, I wanted to convey a feeling through the written word, through the script that, um, that Nick could sort of latch onto and use as a inspiration for his artwork. So I, I wanted for the tonal feel um, for there to be and that sort of interplay between what he is going to produce visually and what I have written on the page. So I've said it in, in my presentation, but um, I'll reiterate it that for us, you know, collaboration was a big engine for this project. Like we were, we were always checking in with each other. Um, and also we, uh, we, we kept, you know, that those lines of communication, open text, email, social media. So the next thing that I wanted to get across was a, a good balance between comedy and drama. So we wanted there to be peril, 
and dire situation for our characters to make it, uh, you know, somewhat of danger um, for our characters to keep the reader involved. But also we wanted to sort of convey like a lightheartedness through this and um, the strength of, you know, um, humor um, overcoming fear and danger. So we sort of wanted to make sure that that, that there was always a, a either a bright side to a really dark situation that we were writing, or there was a way out of it for our characters, you know. A big thing for me, <clears throat> and I talked about this earlier um, when I talked about the who of the project, uh, I, I wanted to aspire to an intergenerational dynamic with our characters. So our main group of characters is a, a young friend group um, and they're in a summer program. And we sort of took major inspiration from like the Goonies, you know, um, and any any of those like uh, little kid friendship group movies. Um, so, but I wanted to aspire to an intergenerational dynamic between our characters where that the, um, the adults were open to interacting and taking into account what the kids had to say and what they were doing. So I think that's an ideal, it's like an idealized situation in our, in our universe that we created. It's, it doesn't always work that way in the real world, but um, I think it's a good model to show that, you know, that the generation should be working together. That's how it always used to be. And I feel like there could be a return to that. And in a lot of communities, there is a, a real return to that. That's um, heartening to hear about. So one of the things that um, that I wanted to be sure to instill in the project and Nick and I talked about right up top is that we wanted an unassuming portrayal of these characters. So these are tribal, um, tribally enrolled kids, you know, and descendants and, you know, the parents work with the tribe, um, which is the fictional Menominee tribe, not the real Menominee tribe. But um, we wanted to do an unassuming portrayal of characters. And what I mean by that is, is not sort of prescribing onto them um, any sort of like stereotypical um, life way or way of being, way of speaking. I feel like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, content that's out there now in terms of the wider audience with like Reservation Dogs, various many different films and um, Rutherford Falls that show a very specific um, portrayal of indigenous characters. I wanted us to have that same feel that those projects have, but not lean too heavily or rely on, you know, that sort of identity character development. Uh, it's all throughout the book, really, um, in artwork, in our artwork and the interactions with our characters, the places. It's all sort of like background stuff in the matrix of, of um, where the story takes place and where the characters interact in the place. You know, that indigenousness, I, I feel like, is a part of that, um, is a part of that matrix, matrices, I think it's the... I think that's the plural. So finally, my final thing here is that I wanted to write up to my audience. I didn't want to write down, um, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want to create scenarios that were very, you know, sort of paint by number or simplistic. I wanted it to be a very involved, layered, nested narrative that you know, someone could really sink their teeth into and go through a quick read, you know, through the book and, and be entertained. And I wanted to promote friendship over, you know, unhealthy attitudes and habits. And uh, I feel like addressing those things through a positive lens of showing what it's like and what life can be like if you're open hearted and open minded towards other people. Um, I feel like that was a major theme for, for me to get across tonally in the story. And uh, just with, with the work that, as you can see in the little video, the time capture video there, the, the work that I'm, I'm doing in the back on the, on the left there on the day bed, and then Nick is doing on the, on the desk, the, the sort of chemistry that happens between 
two artists speaking to each other, bouncing ideas off each other, talking about the written word, talking about visual. I mean, I think we found a great, struck a great balance between, you know, the visual and what's written on the page. So thank you guys. I'm gonna give up control of this, I think. Back to, yeah. Yeah, so that that was my sort of, you know, um, quick spiel about how we created our universe, Nick. And I'll hand it off to you, sir. All righty. Yeah, so Justin really hit a lot of the um, sort of uh, written word and sort of like pre-world building, like developmental things that we did, just, you know, open communication with each other um, and all, all that good stuff. It was super fun and it, it's just a joy to work with them <laughs> and have this connection. But yeah, so whereas I was sort of like, you know, guiding him a little bit as he like took control of like that area, uh, the inverse happens uh, when I do the visual development. So whereas I'm sort of like, you know, ideating the world and stuff, I always go to Justin for inputs. And I'll talk more about that in my presentation, which I will get up in a second. Start that. All right. Cool. So can everyone see it? All right. <laughs> I'm going to get my notes up over here. Cool. So uh, yeah, this is the uh, visual side of making comics, uh, visual development, and how to steal from the world around you. <laughs> there we go. So uh, yeah, just a slight introduction uh, to reintroduce myself. Uh, I'm Nicholas Schweitzer. Uh, I'm a graduate of UW Stout, uh, which you saw on my sweatshirt in Justin's uh, video. <laughs> uh, I got my degree in entertainment design uh, with a concentration of comics and sequential arts, and also have a minor in English writing and literature, which really helped me out when <laughs> working with Judd on the uh, writing aspect of it. Uh, currently, um, I work at uh, the Sustainable Development Institute at the College of Menominee Nation as your media specialist. Uh, so I'm both presenting and then live streaming this on our Facebook page. So sort of a double whammy with me. <laughs> and also, I'm a first ascendant of the Menominee Tribe of Wisconsin. So to get started, uh, I'll talk a little bit about my approach to visual development. And uh, to quote, to sort of quote Pablo Picasso, uh, good artists copy great artists steal. There's a little bit of debate on if he actually said that, but we're going to say that it's attributed to him. So the, this is really a great uh, truth about being an artist is it's not like we come up with everything like on a whim. We see a lot of stuff in our world and just like ex in the experience of being a human. So as a result, we have like this amazing index of reference images for objects and people already available like in our minds just that we could pull from so in a reality we we steal from the world around us and i suggest that to like everyone who is uh looking to be an artist just steal from whatever you see and that's sort of the over-encompassing theme of, uh, of my aspect of this so i'm going to talk a little bit about character design um and for this comic there are three different ways that i designed uh the characters uh the first one was basing them off of real people um, and this is like a great starting point uh, for designing people who are like or inspired uh, by the people in your life. So designing characters based off the people that they're based on. Uh, and for example, we'll look at uh, a, a, one of our main characters, Wright. So Wright is a local culture keeper who is called upon to help uh, after a plant pathologist for the local government organization fails to identify the plant that's uh, in our story. And by the way, some of this might be just a little bit spoilery, but I'm thinking of it as a tease for the narrative. <laughs> um, so our inspiration for Wright uh, was, is Jeff Greeno, um, who is also a local culture keeper with a wealth of knowledge of Monomany forests and plant communities. And I got a little picture of him uh, right there, just so you have an idea of what he looks like. So I'm like going back and forth. Um, <laughs> uh, with Jeff as our basis, I began drawing him as a reference to get an idea of how to visually flesh out uh, Bright, 
Uh, so this led to me like drawing him many, many times. So uh, I would recommend for this, uh, just create a many reference drawings to study the person of inspiration. And then eventually, if you keep drawing them, eventually you'll get your reference image off, like just down pat. And then it'll start to shift where it becomes sort of second nature uh, to you and becomes more influenced by your drawing style. So that's what happened. Uh, when I was drawing Jeff to get to write. So that's the first way that I did uh, character design. The second way was taking inspiration from other characters. So that was another way that I designed characters was referencing other characters that were similar to them from other media. Uh, for an example, we'll look at the character of Josa. Uh, so Josa is uh, this intuitive kid and a champion of the model. And uh, in our story, the kids represent a facet of each uh, 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 I want to say medallion, but that's what I attribute to uh, dimension of the model. So he represents the human perception, activity, and behavior of the Minami model. And for this, um, I was also pulling from the previous one of referencing uh, real people. And so I based Josa a little bit off of my cousin Alex and also uh, Ness, who's pictured here from the video game Earthbound. Um, yeah. And so for taking reference from Ness um, and the word Sa, uh, uh, the word sa means little in Minami. And Justin and I thought it would be really funny to make someone who has little in their name super tall. <laughs> Just a fun, like, sort of uh, uh, interfering uh, character trait. So that resulted in the creation of Josa, who is uh, pictured on the uh, right. So those are just a couple of initial drawings of him, uh, and which would eventually lead to the final drawings. Um, so that's the second way I do it. And then Version three, you just sometimes got to create original people, you know. Um, <laughs> so this process uh, from the way I did it is just by taking the, the physical attributes that you sort of have stored in your mind. Uh, I wrote uh, mind files, sort of like an X files thing, but but not really like a filing system. But uh, so pretty much like we we've seen noses, we've seen eyes, we've seen like different types of hair, faces, body types. And so a way that I created original people was sort of like a Mr. Potato Head factor where you just like take random attributes and just start sticking it uh, and seeing what fits and what works. So that's how I designed uh, these characters. Um, but also your mental images can only go so far. So I have to search up images. I, I at least searched up images online for reference material and Google image is just a great resource to find reference material to draw upon. Um, so yeah, those are like the three forms uh, that I use for designing the characters. Um, then we'll move on to prop design, which is just like fleshing out the world around you. And the items in each location should reflect an aspect of the character who it belongs to. So the materials that are owned by a character, like I said, should reflect who they are as a person. And so an example that I have for here is uh, one of our other characters, Dr. Victor Clive, who is a messy, disorganized scientist who works for a structured industrial science lab. So very two conflicting values working with each other. So initially I just drew up this design of an office with papers strewn about and sticky notes label everything just to help organize himself, but really just gets in the way. I and mean, he's just looking at different sticky notes. It's like, wait, this is supposed to be here, but then also, you know, just sort of, it's kind of distracting for him. And with that, I drew that out and then I checked in with Justin and this is our collaboration at work just to see what he thought about that. And he said, and I quote in the text message, Yes, maybe two clicks less with the comforts, but the right, but is right on for messiness. A more stuffy couch, mid-century modern, perhaps. Maybe a rectangular rug with blocky geometric designs. This is awesome. These could be carryovers from his career as a college professor. Just an idea. So with that input, I redesigned some of the attributes to reflect more of his character. So instead of sort of <laughs> uh, this futon, which is actually inspired by the futon behind me, uh, <laughs> You know, like I said, great artist steel. Um, I, instead of using what I already had, I searched up like the design that Justin was referring to and sort of like the sort of genre of couch and um, rug that he was suggesting. And I redesigned it and those will be in the set dressing when I draw that scene. So yeah, it's that kind of collaboration that just keeps 
me on my toes and also make sure that I'm getting across what Justin wanted when he wrote it. So it's, it's very fun. And then the final type of design I'll talk about is nature design. So uh, <laughs> I, as soon as I wrote this title, I'm like, oh, it's so good. So creating the plantagonist. I got a good thumbs up from Justin, so that's good. So our plantagonist is, uh, oh, I wrote something down for this. Okay. So at the center of our narrative is a plant that's infecting people on the reservation. Uh, for its design, I combined two deadly plants into one. Uh, what was recommended uh, by Jeff Greeno was to reference the white baneberry, which is seen on the left, uh, which is also known as doll's eye. It's a very poisonous plant that, well, kind of looks like little marshmallows, you know, like the marshmallow minis that you put in hot chocolate, with just a little black eye on it, which is where it gets the doll's eye name. And then also, Justin and... Um, Dr. Frank Kutka, who works in the SDI office with me, uh, was were telling me uh, about the plant called hogweed, which actually grows uh, on the reservation. I just, this summer, I saw some growing down our trail. So if you're walking down it, avoid it at all costs because the plant hogweed is a light sensitive plant that has a sap uh, in its root to help protect itself. But as a result, anytime where the sap touches on your skin, if that gets uh, hit with any like photons or light rays, it'll create like a really wicked burn effect on you. And it apparently it's just horrible and it sticks in your skin for like years and it's just awful and you can't go outside in the summer. So it's no fun. So that inspired the design of this plant where it has sort of a white baneberry uh, sort of top mixed with the hogweed sort of flower stem. And then also uh, just like a whole long, uh, stem with a sort of these spiky uh leaves and then also the entire stem itself is very like hairy and it has it's sort of like um a needle for the sap so anything that touches it no bling <laughs> um and yeah so that's sort of my approach to design um and a lot of it was just pulling from what i either knew or looking at what was around me or even just researching it so a lot of design work as an artist is just what you have committed to memory but also it's research and just making sure that you can jot down and like recreate items that you're either looking at or recall so either it could be one-to-one -one or it could be remixed like i mentioned the mr potato head <laughs> so yeah um it's also and out of my section, I'd like to say thanks to our event sponsors, the American Indian College Fund, who's, you know, uh, funding our comic book, very cool. And then also the College of Menominee Nation and Sustainable Development Institute. These two organizations uh, make us capable of being able to work and, you know, being the housing factors of this, uh, the grant funds. And, you know, also a good resource for getting input from people in the community. So, yeah. Um, and then, I'll end this with our any question section, but also uh, here is a finalized look at our characters um, and our story. And these are the kid, kid characters, our sort of goonies, as Justin mentioned. Uh, so we have the twins, Moses and Mimi, Josa, who we looked at before, uh, his cousin Jacob, and then Helen and Emma. Uh, yeah, and Moses and Josa are, well, they're kids, so they're not acting right. <laughs> But yeah, so um, any questions? I'll check both chats real quick. See if there's any. Yeah, we have a, looks like in the chat, we have, do not have a camera in the library. Hope for my another class, Nick, consider that the, Nick, consider that the symbols as the politician in the picture, culture, or a fake representation of our world. Is it important to show or not in the world that you are designed comedy and drama? Hmm. So from my understanding of the question, um, there is a fun factor of showing and telling with uh, representing comedy and drama. So I actually have a couple of pages that I'm doing right now. And one of them is like this large comedy scene that involves a skeleton. And a lot of that is just, I'm physically showing like the kids ragging on each other, which is just a fun thing. Um, so I think the visual representation of that is 
sort of important if you want to get across what the narrative is showcasing. And then consider the symbols as the politician in the picture, culture, or a fake representation of our world. Hmm. That's yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we we showed a politician per se. I think we we actually talked a bit about um, early on in our writing process, like sort of having that like the political side of things even you know part of um another realm that doesn't really influence the story you mentioned the sofa in laboratory so oh sure that oh okay okay so um sort of reflecting on uh real materials versus fake materials that i'm recreating yeah i think well uh it is very much easier to just recreate things one-to-one -one, but if someone wants to get a little more creative with the design work, I'm certainly can look at multiple images uh, based on the same design set uh, to help reflect the character more and create sort of a uh, unified amalgam version of some of the materials and stuff just to help like drive that uh, sort of sense behind them, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, we, we talked a little bit about um, that character, Professor Clive. And the his, we we talked um, over each of the characters' backstory somewhat. So we had that um, in his recent past is that he was part of academia. You know, he was a professor at a college before he worked for this um, agricultural business, this seed company. So the introduction of that sort of like staid, mid-century modern element into his office was sort of a carryover and it represented too that he was that he sort of brought his like lack, lackadaisical attitude of of being a messy professor you know and maybe we were figuring that maybe he got let go from the college you know <laughs> but um yeah so you know that was just sort of like we uh nick mentioned a couple times how there was a lot of like um working against the grain with the characters so that you know um the fact that he like has this like um really linear furniture and geometric block rug seems like he would have his stuff like his life in order you know he would have that same linear approach to things but in actuality he's like a nutty professor kind of he's just like an absent-minded professor you know mm -hmm. so that I, I feel like um not to get too deep into the weeds but like there's a visual um it's like a visual humor that's there that is not apparent but uh it would play in in, in your subconscious we would hope mm. just the fact that there's these um post-it notes everywhere too which i laughed when when you said that because of like on this wall right here it's just covered in various post-it notes and there's like no order whatsoever <laughs> to any of them i mean my desk at work is the exact same way so i think we yeah. can relate to i think a little bit of ourselves are in that character <laughs> for sure yeah for sure yeah we had a late a late stage um change to that character we had a different name for him earlier we renamed him um because I had listened to a, a podcast about the making of Frankenstein. So that was, um, that was sort of um, impetus for me to like redress the character and change his name basically was the big, the big change, but it's like homage to, uh, to those artworks. Um, I think Nick touched on a really important thing in that, um, you know, stealing from the real world. I think we do that every day. Um, and I think like iteration is um, the mother of invention mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Like if you do something again and again and again, you find new new ways to use it or new, new ways to address things. So that's sort of a, one of the roles of, you know, our um, our use of our reuse our recycling of, of a lot of like narrative devices from uh, western culture and also from indigenous culture and 
so yeah we we put quite a bit of thought into into that aspect of the project too do we have uh, it looks like we have a question about the style as well uh whether it's oh, cool. unrealistic or semi-realistic hmm. um so my my style that i tend to use is very it's kind of both where there is a sense of realism with it but also i break that and go like full cartoon um and i'm just thinking <laughs> back to the couple pages i did there's a scene where a character goes from like super realistic to like maybe two panels later just like this blob with like large crying eyes and there's water just like in it and it's just it, it sort of varies <laughs> so yeah i i kind of use those to help um uh showcase more of like the emotion that the character is feeling or just like what uh justin was aiming for in the scene so yeah while one character is acting like that the others are just like same like not same face but normal face and just like you're going to like intense on this ease back a little <laughs> bit <laughs> yeah I, I was really um i really like nick's art style um uh, it really reminds me of uh, like the archie com the riverdale gang you know um in ways i mean it's different from that but it there so there's those original like little grocery store comic book rack mini no, like novella style books and and that there's some of that animation style that you have but i was really like <clears throat> it's like a marriage between that style and um I just love that work like collaborating with people because you learn about new things, you know, and Nick introduced uh, Nick and Jacob both introduced me to um, Chip Zadarsky, um, the comic book writer, you know, and he did a he actually did a like a, a modern day run of Jughead um, from the Riverdale gang. So it was like a trade paperback book. It was about yay big and, you know, about yay thick. But that art style, it, it's like a marriage between that old Archie's Riverdale gang and that new, oh, I, I apologize, I don't know the name of the artist from the Zadarsky uh, Jughead book, but it was like a, a cool, like your style sort of reminds me of that, of like a amalgamation or a mix of those two. And, you know, also I think um, one of the things that was like a grounding thing for us was that, um, we talked early on, like I said, about are we going to go over the top like Marvel Universe, like Superman, aliens, you know, laser, AI, what, what are we going to do, you know, and one of the early things was that we wanted to sort of root it in what would be considered a possible reality, you know, so that I feel like as mundane as that is in comparison to like you know a death of superman <laughs> run or something like that um as mundane as that sounds i feel like that is sort of like the um that's sort of like the ground that nick can build on with his artwork so that we keep like a real level plane for him to create his artwork on and it just sort of floats really nice on that I feel like um on that sort of realism that we went for the the sort of quasi realism you know um there are a few instances in our in our story where um you you might be reading it and be like yeah right that wouldn't happen or that couldn't happen or that shouldn't happen you know but um I feel like we sort of came from a place of like well it, this could happen you know that, that's how we we approached it really but then there was i i liked working in that way because then there was always like this undercurrent of reality that we, we could return back to if one of us went too far and it was mostly me all the time like what about this then i'd be way out in left field and nick would be like yeah but you know we're trying to be realistic here okay i'll, I'll read this question nick what does native cartoon character mean in the roles with Westworld in the Western world? Example, the pollution is more West industry 
and the conservation of balance in the forest is more into culture and native indigenous. It is relation with water, plants, animals, mother earth to look for a balance. Well stated. Yeah. yeah. So I think with our narrative, um, we really try to strike that balance between the Western world and the sort of indigenous world. Uh, Cause <laughs> there is sort of a conflict uh, of interest in there where it's like having both of them go up against each other. And there is a scene of that in the story. And so I think what we sort of establish is there is kind of a balance for the, like we showcase sort of more so the benefits of the native American perspective, like T E K versus S E K. Uh, what, but, what are those? can you oh yes sorry what that what that um, is uh tk is traditional ecological knowledge and then sek is scientific ecological knowledge so it's the understanding of the environment and the world around you from uh, a sort of traditional indigenous lens versus the western uh, lens so whereas we perceive it more so as like we're caretakers of nature uh the western lens is more so like looking at it as a resource um and those very much so influence like a lot of uh parts of either culture um like for us it influences a lot of our language and stuff like that um and yeah so of where was i uh yeah, for sure man <laughs> I, I was just gonna say like um i worked uh five six years on the poso project uh that was an educational um educational project and it was really was a really well-funded attempt to try to find a way to combine traditional ecological knowledge and scientific ecological knowledge into something you know and and we did a lot of like venn diagramming there was hours and hours and hours of dialogue between scientists and culture keepers and language people and community people and you know plant pathologists and all this stuff and, be, and being witness to that um i feel that there is there, there's a ground where those two meet and can be beneficial to each other but man it's really a fleeting thing you know it, it it, I, I feel it comes down to personal interpersonal relationship between the two people. If you have a really staunch supporter and believer in science, Western science versus somebody who's, you know, maybe not and, and this Western science person is, is sort of like a, um, an adherent to Western culture, right. And doesn't have like a, a really specified community-based worldview then when that when that set of ideas meets with someone who has a really specified cultural acuity in like an indigenous community that can make for a really interesting conversation especially when they're talking about like yields for tim old timothy hay or something like that you know um something as as you know obscure as that can spark a really interesting conversation um but yeah, I, I think it's incredible opportunity for us to make this comic book because like, like Nick said, we can promote, you know, our worldview and at the same time pay respect to that other worldview. So we, we kind of want to, as artists and as people, we want to encapsulate that, that little mercurial moment where those two worlds can meet and work together. But of course, we got to throw like some drama and danger and comedy in there to make it interesting, you know? So yeah. that's, it, it really is a great um, question that you brought, uh, that you brought up. Who, who said that? Uh, Dulce. Dulce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great um, observation because it, it it is something that we thought a lot about and that we instilled into the book in multiple ways. Um, yeah. <laughs> We want more indigenous superheroes. Hey, all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm down. I'm yeah. down with that. Same here. 
Uh, we got a question. Well, not a question, but a comment from our Facebook chat telling us that uh, Erica Henderson is the artist on Chip Zartsky's Jughead series. So. Oh, OK, cool. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for looking. Yeah. Thank you for knowing that. Yep. that was, I mean, I, I love that little book, man. I wish there was more. I think there's like three volumes of that or something. I know that there's multiple volumes. I just got, I only had availability for one at the library. So yeah, <laughs> it's my pitch for libraries. Hey, if everybody out there, if you like saving money, if you like free stuff, use your local library. I mean, they have stuff that you don't even think they have. Like there's a, there's a library in, in Howard here down in Green Bay. They have a cake pan library where you can check out different shaped cake pans and like, hey, did you ever want to, you know, bake a cake in the shape of a maple leaf? You can do that. You can go to your local library. Yeah. Especially now. Quick pitch. Yeah. Yeah. Quick pitch. <laughs> but yeah, in terms of like the indigenous superheroes, I'm excited for, um, for the future of that, um, especially from indigenous artists and writers. I feel like there's a real, um, for decades, there's been people doing that work underground, creating those characters and doing like really small run, limited prints, you know, uh, books that are, that would be considered like collectible now, you know? But I feel like there's um, in the Marvel universe, there's like Echo, there's um, uh, what's his name from uh, X-Force? Um, he's on the X-Men. Oh, um, um, oh I, I almost had it there for a second. Uh, he's his knives. Yeah. He's a knife guy. Is it something uh, star? I can't remember his name. No, I don't no. think so. Maybe I'm thinking of the guy from Deadpool too. Yeah. Well, there's Forge too, like Forge from the X-Men. Like I had no idea in, in high school when I was reading all that X-Men, I had no idea he was a Native American character, man. Like they didn't write him as one. They just wrote him as like, he looked like George Hamilton, you know, he just looked like he was sort of like ethnically ambiguous guy, you know, mm -hmm. with a mustache and like a little ponytail. So it wasn't like, it was never like made apparent in the books that I read anyway, that Forge was Native American. And he's like one of the most powerful X-Men uh, <laughs> with, his, with his ability, you know, like he could build any weapon. I mean, he's a great character, but like, I think um, that that's correct. We need more indigenous superheroes and we need them to be indigenous and we need them to come right out and just say, yeah. Know, like I am indigenous, I am from here. These are my people. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree too. Yeah. Also, e Echo Phoenix song. I want to. I want to read that too. Oh yeah, yeah, that yeah. looks really interesting. <laughs> yeah. What? Um. Any other questions from the chat? You can type them in, or. <laughs> I think Dulce just wants us to write, like, to create an indigenous superhero. You know what? I got but something working do, on the back burner for that. Do so that. Give me five oh, cool. years. I'll see where I get with that. <laughs> <laughs> five years. Yeah. Just one of the little notes in my idea binder. So <laughs> cool. Yeah, man. You need those. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we got like six minutes left on by my clock. Um, well, that could be wrong. My my phone says 10 minutes minutes all right. i'm all over the place <laughs> but um that's all right yeah <laughs> we have like um a little extra time and that's fine i mean yeah. we covered a lot of stuff <clears throat> and i i don't want to spoil anything from the book <laughs> otherwise i would share more but i mean I, I, like on the process side we covered a lot but on the production side we can share a little bit of um, yeah because that's still um, so, part of making a comic book you know <laughs> yeah yeah for sure so we're like both nick and i are are, are like new to well nick has um you know higher education in, in comics and sequential arts i have a, a master in screenwriting but i'd never worked on a comic book before proper um so we're both um we're both uh sort of going through the process of getting a book produced 
together, which mm -hmm. I think is, it seems really interesting to me as the writer, like I'm done with the clickety clack part, like the story's down. Now Nick is like uh, taking that and turning it into the visual and I'm getting like texts pretty much every day of the progress. And I'm like, wow, man, it's really cool to see. And I can't wait to see, you know, the process of us getting it printed and all that stuff. Yeah. So we're Amy getting to the has start a question. Yeah, Any, we're getting to the start of that. Any yeah. date yet on the final Art Walk event? Great that, question. That is an excellent question. Um, we'll have to see. Don't we have something? Don't we have something down for that? Uh, potentially, but we don't. We don't really. Yeah. Do we? At, as with the progress of this, dates might change. So, yeah. Yeah. I, well, it should be happening eventually, you know. <laughs> in, in April, though, right? Uh, April, I, I believe, is sort of the date that we're aiming for, but we'll see. Right. We'll see if we get there. <laughs> Oh, Kayla's got a good question here. Yeah, so for the art walk, I can't wait for that either. Uh, yeah, yeah, that should be fun. We got some fun ideas yeah. for that. <laughs> yeah. Would, would Here's a good question for you, Nick. Would you ever want to turn your comic into a cartoon or animation from Kayla? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a benefit to having that done where it gets it out to more people. And also, it's just fun to see uh, our story in motion. But yeah, I think uh, that would be interesting. It just, I possibly would want to be on the creative team of that because, uh, Justin, I'm certain you probably feel the same way, but this is like our baby, man. <laughs> and uh, we, we don't yeah. want to leave our baby with anyone that might not take care of it well. So, <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it would be like, um, it would be great to do like if this went beyond this grant project like another issue or a series of issues but then i could see you know like if it is established as a series then you know like you and i stepping out of that eventually and handing it off to somebody that would be the ideal for me the classic you know, yeah to, yeah to be able to like create something that sustains and and keeps going and is like an artistic outlet for people coming into the college. That would be nice. You yeah. Know, but that takes some, um, that it's like, uh, I always say like people, when you're in college, you know, people will say, you should study this. And then it's like, well, yeah, that's a, that's a major, you know, that's, you have to write a dissertation on that and commit you know, that's like your life for four years or whatever. So it does take that passion to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It'd be cool. But it'd to be see cool. It on TV. Yeah. I would love to see that. Yeah. I, I think animation is very, is a lot of work. Huh? Yeah. Cause I, I've had a little bit of an opportunity to study in college and oh my goodness. It's just, it's such you need a team. You, you do need a team. Uh, yeah. You need a team for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, definitely. It, it would be super cool, cool. to see. Yeah. Uh, looks like Dulce left one more question and then I think she might have left or yeah. It looks like. She's yeah. Not, not so much a question, but just a, a statement. Caledonia made Franklin Richards with the Fantastic Four. She's an ancient clans. This to me is their fierce loyalty and protection of loved one, family folklore, Caledonia. Yeah, I have to read more of that um, uh, FF, Future Force and all, is that what it's called? Future Foundation? Future Foundation, yeah. With, with Franklin Richards and all that. Like I've read it once before, but it was years ago when it first came out. So I, I'll have to reread that. Yeah. And that's sort of the fun of this job is like, new stuff keeps coming out every month and there's also a bunch of yeah. stuff from way back when and you're just always trying to like <laughs> take it as much Keep as you can and, yeah yeah sure six o'clock guy hey thank you everybody yeah for listen, listening to us ramble about creativity and creating a universe yeah 
Um, any other like last minute questions? Just putting it out there. Doesn't even have to be related to the event. Maybe even just comics. <laughs> We're good. Seems like it. All um, righty. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Yep. Thank you so much. Hey, have a have a good one, Nick. I'll, yeah. I'll message you soon, man. Heck yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. Oh. See bye, you later, buddy, guys. bye, Kayla. <laughs>